the reason for restart was, what is what is not working here? You know, we did the first uh, brain scans of traumatized people and saw that their brain was very weirdly organized. And we got interested in physiology because it's obviously in people's bodies. And so I hang out with physiology friends like Roger Pittman and Mark Greenberg. And then so we started to really sort of begin to spell out how it works. And that was really uh, a marvelous scientific quest. It was actually very exciting in those early days where we started off knowing nothing. And then every few months, one of us discovered another little piece of the puzzle, another piece of the puzzle. And so it was very exciting time to be alive and to be uh, to have a group of discoverers of how things work and then the challenge became how to get people better and uh, you know all we knew in our culture you either give people drugs or you yak you talk and you know and talking is also important uh, but then we really got to see how people's bodies continue to react the way it is in the past, and that no amount of talking would make the imprint of the trauma go away. And so the very first thing that really opened up my mind to become bold was when we learned EMDR, which is a very strange treatment where you wiggle your fingers in front of people's faces as they remember their trauma. And much to my amazement, people calmed down and said, yes, it happened to me, it sucked, but it was a long time ago. And so for me, that EMDR really opened it up because it didn't fit any of our paradigms. Wiggling your fingers in front of people's faces is a weird thing to do. And then they got better, or not all of them. And, uh, and my research has always been like, who gets better and who doesn't get better. I've ne never been a fan of one particular method. And sometimes some methods work very well. And for some other people, they don't work. And then it's always been. So what else is there? What else can we do to change these things? And as I understanding about the imprint of trauma on developing mind and brain, I became more and more curious about all kinds of methods, uh, neurofeedback, uh, did a bunch of research on that, uh, yoga, theater groups, music, uh, and we really got into uh, the rhythmicity of people's bodies, the rhythmicity of our interactions. As I'm talking to you, I move my face and you move your face in the mirror thing. And if you're not at just the right moment, I feel what a cool guy. And if you're not at the moment, you go like, this guy's out for lunch. And so we have these very subtle interactions with each other. And what became obvious that when you get traumatized, all these rhythms break down. And so you really lose a sense of pleasure and of connection with human beings. And so then the question comes, how can we restore uh, the sense of connection with each other? My, my book is, has case histories in every chapter because my teacher says, your, your patients are your only textbook. <laughs> you know, and you write the textbooks afterwards, but you learn from the people themselves. And then the textbooks are always less accurate about what's going on than the people themselves. And so, uh, you know, one group of people I was really intrigued with is people who cut themselves and who slash themselves, who burn themselves. And um, most therapists say, oh, that's a terrible thing, you shouldn't do that. But, you know, as long as you don't cut me, uh, and you cut yourself, I have no business telling you that you shouldn't be doing that. And my question is, how, why do you do that? What does it do for you? Uh, how do you learn how to do that? That's become quite a habit. How do you feel about having that habit? And so we got into the... Uh, psychology and the neurobiology of self-mutilation. And we discovered some very interesting things about brain opioids that get released and uh, the brain of the capacity to shut off pain. And so we really got to see gradually in our research how trauma has a very deep impact on the most elementary um, life-sustaining forces, has an impact on your immune system, on 
how you see the world, how you sleep, how you appetite, how you organize your your bowels even. So so he, uh, we got away from this body mind split, and what became more and more obvious and that's not stopped as we're still there. Uh, that uh, your the body keeps a score, and so the body lives out that sense of threat. And uh, something that we really haven't really uh, definitely resolved at all is how do we help people to live in a body that works for them now and not a body that continues to be shaped by what happened back then, which now messes you up. It's really, it's, it's a whole layer of things. I, I think the first order of business is to allow yourself to know that it happens. Huh? And so if you have a natural disaster, your house burns up, you have no problem saying to people, my house got burned up. But if you get raped in a nightclub or you get uh, raped by your uncle, uh, it becomes very hard to speak the truth because people around you will either blame you or say, no, your uncle is a beautiful man. You're making up the story. And so... Uh, Getting to a point that you can admit to yourself, very much like in AA, you have to say, you have to admit to yourself that I'm alcoholic. As the traumatized person, you need to admit to yourself, yes, I was very hurt there and then, then, and that has left some very deep traces on me. And then you have to really understand how the past has continued to affect you in the present. That's, I think that step number one is being honest with yourself. Uh, and finding somebody with whom you can be honest with about us. Uh, and that's oftentimes very difficult, particularly intrafamilial trauma, uh, where kids get told, it isn't true, you're making it up, get over it. Uh, and so we have met thousands of people have a legacy of these long-term things that they couldn't talk about. And finding language for yourself then becomes very difficult. And then the next big issue is when you are, particularly when you're a kid and something bad happens to you, you blame yourself. You think, uh, I, this must have happened to me because I'm a fundamentally bad or flawed person. So it always becomes part of your identity and you get to need to un know that. And then you need to develop a capacity to have compassion for that creature who you are. Huh? And that's actually a very difficult issue, telling people, be compassionate or love yourself doesn't do the trick. People need to go very deep inside. And the first thing that looked like it really could help with that was meditation. Uh, but meditation is very hard for traumatized people because the imprint of trauma is inside. And when you become uh, uh, angry, upset, traumatized, you don't want to feel yourself. You want to make the feeling go away. Huh? And so you say, get over it, don't go back there. So there's a lot of self-hatred there, and we need to get there somehow. So what helped with that? Yoga helped with that. And beginning to live in a body that you take care of, and that you move, and it becomes a living organism, uh, that research turned out to be particularly fruitful. Uh, it's the first study on studies on yoga uh, for trauma ever done. And then we learned that you can rewire the brain. You can actually play computer games with your own brain and change brain circuitry, neurofeedback. Uh, so these were all very exciting discoveries. And then the latest thing is that I was part of this very large study of MDMA ecstasy for uh, trauma. And before we started the study, I told my colleagues, you know, you should only study people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, namely people who at some point were doing just fine and then something terrible happened. And let's not have people who have always felt traumatized. I was overruled and the stunning uh, finding of our MDMA for PTSD study was that the vast majority of, of people were people who had never felt safe, who had never felt cared for, and that got opened up. And so the issue of psychedelics is a very gigantically important topic. And uh, that's what much of my work is about right now. It is 
unbelievable. No, nobody ever thought that my book would be over five years on the New York Times bestseller list, being translated into 43 different languages. And all too often people say to me, and that embarrasses me actually somewhat, is you saved my life. And my reaction is really, no, you saved your life because you had the courage to read this very difficult book because it is a difficult book. And actually, my one of my first reviews on Amazon was particularly telling. Um, she said, this is a horrible book. It's disgusting. I did not know how to hard to throw it into my fireplace. And I go, yeah, that's what it's like to read about trauma. You get triggered and you become very upset. And so I'm all impressed with every single person who actually can read it. And everybody always tells me, I had to put it down. I got really upset. I got freaked out. Uh, and I just had to continue to read it slowly in order to understand what's going on with me. But the degree to which people have found it helpful, of course, is enormously gratifying and uh, and really also quite unexpected. If I had been talking to you right now, I'd be working on our next book. It's called uh, Come to Your Senses embodied where self-awareness on how to actually uh, open up your pathways towards your body to yourself and how to actually re-regulate yourself after trauma i don't think it will do quite as well as the body keeps score but no nothing does as well as the body keeps the score so 